Is that sharing now for everyone? It is. It is. Okay. Let me pull this up. Um, I'll hit on a couple of things that, that John said, but just to give everybody a quick introduction, um, as John mentioned, my name is Matt Warren. I'm with PYA, and I know you've had the opportunity to speak with uh, a couple of folks from our team. Um, I'm actually in our valuation group, and, and you know, valuation is something that's very exciting to me. It's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, I actually started my career, I, I still am a CPA, so I have a, a strictly numbers background. So when John mentions things like, um, you know, I think of this as much more of a science than an art, I think that's one thing that one goes with my background, but also plays into the fact that my career has changed from the days that I was simply doing accounting and evaluation. And valuation as a whole is much more of an art. And I think that's one of the reasons that I get so excited about it um, because you get to actually get in and really understand businesses, understand what's driving their, their future projections and, and how reasonable that is. And that's where the appraisal process really comes into place. Um, so I'm going to plan to expand on, on several of these topics as we talk today, but I really wanna make sure that this is as valuable as possible for everyone here. Um, I really wanna make sure everybody gets a lot out of this. So feel free to jump in and interject. Um, as I said, I do this every day and it becomes second nature to me. And I don't wanna lose anybody getting too deep into to just thinking valuation as a whole. Um, so if you have questions, definitely jump in. Um, John, I know you can probably see the chat feature. I don't think I can see it while presenting, but if somebody wants to, to have more discussion on a certain topic, definitely feel free. Um, so talking about some of the methods for valuing a startup, I, John helped me pull this together. And I think this is a really good high level overview of the different things that, that appraisers look at. Taking a step back, there's really three ways to value a company. And when we're talking about the value of a company, it, it's really the, by definition, the price that any willing buyer and any willing seller will put up for the, the specific business. It, it's basically a, a monetary exchange. And I think that's really important to think about because there can be offer prices that are extremely high that maybe a willing buyer won't necessarily be interested in. And, and there may be buyers that have unrealistic expectations to, to what the seller is willing to get. So it's really the combination of both of those. Um, and what a lot of that will play back into is the different risk and the, the different considerations, the, the rate of return an investor is going to expect. Um, the different cost of capital that, that brings up the industry. And there's really different ways to look at this. Um, I go back to really, there's three approaches that an appraiser can take. And this is no different than if you're buying a house and, and you think about the appraisal that you get on your house, there's a market approach, a cost approach, and an income approach. And if you're thinking about a house, the key things you look at are our cost and a market approach. You see this on the appraisal. You'll see what would be the cost to rebuild this in the same place. That, that's really your cost. What's the assets that are underlying this, this investment? The market is when you look out and you see, hey, there's these houses going in this neighborhood and this zip code, but this house over here has a fourth bedroom, whereas the one that you're looking at has three bedrooms. So how do I make adjustments to this? So when you're thinking about what the market holds that really plays into, you know, how similar am I to, is my company to other market data points and, and what adjustments do I need to make to be representative of that? And I think that's really important, especially at a startup level, because it becomes a question of how comparable am I to the market? Um, I know John hit on the, the average value and you know, just thinking about how your company compares to these is going to be very important because different companies are going to come out on completely different ends of that spectrum to get to get to that average. And that's where it's important to, to really think of how to adjust. Um, industry benchmarks, 
you know, this is an area that I think is really helpful for everybody to, to think about. I think everybody hears about these. These are the first things that pop into mind when people talk about valuation. Um, the number that jumps out to me is EBITDA, which is earnings before income tax depreciation and amortization. So basically your, your revenue that's left after your expenses are paid. Um, this is one that investors think of a, of a lot. What's the value to the EBITDA? And what that's telling you is how long it's going to take to get your money out of the business. Um, revenue and, and PE, price to earnings, are, are other areas that you'll, you'll hear a lot. And again, I want everybody to think about this from the, the standpoint of what's the market versus what's my company. Um, because I think making that connection is going to be really important. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to hit on as an introduction is thinking about how values change based on the developmental stages. And I'm going to hammer this home in a minute with um, a little bit more detailed chart, but I think it's important to see that, that the expected value tends to go up over time. And the reason for this is because it's getting less and less risky for a potential investor. And there's more history of potential earnings, an investor can see that future revenue growth is, is coming out there. Whereas the initial idea, there's still a whole lot of risk as to whether that will ever come to fruition. So that's where there's gonna be a much lower valuation at that point. So as we jump into this, I think we've already talked a little bit about some of the, the key considerations, thinking about the, the cost and market approach. Um, so I want to spend some more time specifically on the return on investment and the rate of return. I think this is a good concept to set a foundation for how value really gets determined. We talk a, talked a moment ago about that value is really the price that's going to be paid for the property to change hands. And it's really the meeting of what the buyer and seller's expectation is, whether it's a company or any other potential transaction. So it really comes back to why does anyone truly invest in a company, whether it's startup or a mature company, they're, they're obviously not doing that out of charity. They, they're expecting to get their money back and they're taking certain risk with that money. So it gets into a question of how much risk is associated with that potential investment. And then what's the length of time that it's going to take for them to get their money out of that. Um, and this is where we really start to see this in perspective. And I want to spend a, a couple of minutes just thinking about how startup companies relate to the, the rate of return that an investor is going to expect in the market. Um, what this is showing you is really the, the different yields and the different rate of returns expected by different investments. And if you look over at the left side, you'll see some of the most conservative investments out there. You think about this from the standpoint of, I have X number of dollars, I want to put them somewhere. Um, how much do I expect to earn? And probably the, the least risky place you can put it um, is going to be that, that one month treasury. And you think about the yield on that, and it's going to be very, very minimal. Um, and the reason for that is there's no there's not much significant risk. There's very little risk on a treasury um, note that it's going to, that the U S government's going to go belly up over the next month. And you're not going to be able to receive that investment even more. So if you want to go even more conservative, you think about how cash exchanges hands, you know, if I have a hundred dollar bill, you're willing to pay me a hundred dollars for it immediately, because that's a value that's going to, um, have zero risk to it. We know we can all take that over to the bank or a store and get the same amount of value out of it. Um, bonds end up being a little bit different. And I think that's where you start to see more of this risk. If you see a, a five-year or 10-year bond that may pay out $1,000 down the road, today you're going to expect to pay about $900 for it. And the reason for that is there is more risk. There's more of a time horizon. Folks may not be able to get the full value. So you're expecting a discount today. Um, so as you look at this and think about the time value of money, you start to see that as you get over to, you know, the corporate bonds, you start to see investors expecting a higher and higher level of return because of the various risk associated with this. Um, 
I think what this does, especially as you get further to the right, is it ties back really closely to what we were talking about earlier, that as you go through the developmental stages of a, of a startup, um, you'll see that risk start to come down. You look at the very early startups, you're, you're talking about a 70% return on investment that, that may be expected by um, a, a potential investor coming in. But once you start getting to, to development and expansion, that number starts to drop to the, the 35, 40, 50 percent range. Um, and, and how that relates to value is basically going to be an increase in value. So as the risk goes down, that that value is going to keep driving up. Um, one thing I wanted to, to just clarify here, and this is just talking to John, I, I, I think about this all as venture capital, and I know you guys have made the distinction between angel investors and venture capital. So especially if you're looking at the startup numbers on this um, further towards the right, what you're going to be seeing is what what you think of as from the angel investment side. So then what leads to this? Why is it more risky to invest in a startup? Um, there's certainly a lot of factors to consider for, for somebody coming in. And the, the first is going to be illiquidity. How does the investor get their money back? Um, you know, I think about, you know, how this plays into the market and the, the items that are harder to get are always going to require a, a discount on the price, which would be the rate of return for the investor. Um, I think the easiest concept to describe this is gift card exchanges um, versus cash. Everybody thinks of cash that you can transact quickly, but gift cards, they're, they're a bit more illiquid, um, certainly not as illiquid as an investment in a business. But if you go online and look at these different sites that exchange gift cards, especially after the holidays, you'll see that there's a significant discount, um, especially on the companies that that in this day coming out of COVID have more and more risk. You look at the the gift cards for companies that have either gone bankrupt over the last year and are restructuring, they're going to have a higher higher discount because you don't know that you'll be able to spend that money. Um, there's also the time horizon. We talked about this a little before, but you're going to have a higher discount the, the longer the time horizon is. So if, if it's going to take an investor 10 years to get their money out of the business, they're going to expect a higher rate of return than they would get if they could get all of their money back in three years. Um, there's certainly uncertainty with the cash flows, and I know there was some discussion about prospective um, financial statements, so I don't want to go too far into that, but the concept here being that the more uncertainty there is with cash flows, and I think for a lot of you, you really see that as you're thinking about pre-revenue and, and thinking what you're going to look like in the future, that there's not really a historical trend to tie back to, so there's still a lot of uncertainty and a lot of risk associated with that. And then the last part is really what's available to secure the investment. What can be collateralized? Um, John talked about how high capital intensive businesses are going to be worth more generally. Um, and I think our next slide is going to hit on that a little bit more and, and show why that is. But the, the moral of it is that the more secure the investment is by either collateral or fixed assets that can be underneath it, you're going to have a safer business for um, somebody coming in to invest. Now, this next slide, I think, is at first glance, a lot of information really fast. Um, and, and I want to spend some time here because I think this hammers home a couple of really valuable concepts. And it goes back to some of the discussions I think you guys have had about different balance sheet concepts, um, whether it's the, the debt or equity or the, the assets that, that everybody has on hand. Um, but I'll start by just thinking, you know, these are all different ways to look at what the entire value of the enterprise is um, and, and what underlies that value. The first column you see here is the WAC, which is the weighted average cost of capital. Um, I think we introduced that term a little bit earlier. But really what you're thinking about here is debt versus equity, um, especially as you're thinking going through the, the various rounds of funding and, and, and bringing in outside investors, you're thinking about giving up equity, which is obviously going to be much more expensive than debt. Um, it, it, and that's a very valuable concept to, to think about this because your debt's going to correspond to 
your items that are perhaps less risky, whereas your equity is going to be the the way you get funds for really the the goodwill and the business idea and the um, idea that this is going to continue to grow in the future. If you look at the second column, and this starts to show the correlation, and this is your um, weighted average return on your assets. And it's going to be about the same as the weighted average cost of capital, but it just breaks it down a bit further. And this starts to tie in that your debt is going to be used, you know, you can collateralize that with things like your working capital, your fixed assets. And this goes back to why highly collateralized businesses are, are going to be inherently worth more because there's much less risk associated with this. Um, this ties into, you know, the the mortgage rates that you can get or funding that's collateralized through debt. Um, you know, somebody is willing to take the risk on that, usually a, an institutional type loan. And the reason for that is they know that if the, the business were to collapse in the future, that they can still get money back by selling the assets that are underlying it. When you start to get up into the, the equity and the, the higher risk factors, um, you really start to think about intangible assets and goodwill. And, and this is the part that, that can't be collateralized. This is the idea of, hey, my business is going to grow substantially and you're valuing that income in the future. Um, and, and this is really what our team looks at um, really on a daily basis. We're looking out and trying to understand what the, the total value of the business is, which is going to include all of these different intangible assets and include the the personal goodwill. And as you go up the spectrum, it continues to get riskier and riskier for a um, investor. And because of that, they're going to expect a higher rate of return. And, and that's really going to play into these EBITDA multiples and the, the discount rate that's going to have to be applied to future earnings when you're trying to get back to what the value of my business is. Um, uh, yeah. Question. Can you give me, can you give us some examples of intangible assets and goodwill, especially goodwill? I mean, what is that? Yeah. And I think, you know, those are, that's a great question. And I think it really plays into, you know, how your business will grow over the next several years. Um, when, when a business starts up, you know, the idea of the business, the, there's going to be some intangible things, things you could potentially sell, but maybe not quantify. Um, intangible assets, I think the, the biggest one that jumps out at the top of my head is your workforce. Um, you know, if, if you have some highly specialized folks that are working on development, those folks are going to be hard to replace. And, you know, they may be pulling a small salary, but you can't just go out and replace them. There's value associated with that. So, you know, if you've got a, a great management team, that's an intangible asset that somebody's willing to pay for. Um, goodwill really gets, you know, I think even a bit higher level. It's going to be the, the business idea. It's going to be things like, um, you know, that expected growth in the future. An investor can look at this and say, I know this is going to be worth more, so I'm willing to pay for that. And, and that's really what your, your difference is there. It's the difference between all of the stuff that can be identified and what somebody's willing to pay, even above and beyond that. And that's where you expect, again, kind of going back to this graph and the, the third column where you're going to expect the higher level of return. Um, so, you know, the folks that are willing to put in more and more than just what you can identify with these intangible assets are going to start to say, hey, I need a higher level of return for that. Are, are there any other questions on this slide? I, I just want to pause here. I know this is a lot of information. And again, I know I come from the, the background that I talk about this every day. So I don't want to lose anyone, but I think there's a lot of valuable um, concepts here that I, I certainly love to make sure everybody has a, a base understanding of. Sounds good. Well, definitely feel free to keep interjecting as we go through this. Um, I also wanted to show this quickly, and I think we 
I don't know, John, if we sent this out to everybody, the, the Loon Creek valuation model, um, but I just wanted to talk briefly about how this works and, and how investors may think about this. Um, there is a calculator that, that we have out there. And I think what you'll see is that that does the math on this much quicker, but I just wanted to put this concept in everybody's mind so they can see you know, how this plays in. And this is really helping you understand the, the required return on investment that somebody's going to expect. And what this does is takes an initial investment of $500,000, assumes the investor is gonna get out after the fifth year. Um, they assume revenue at, in the fifth year is about $10 million and, and they want a, a, a price to equity of about 15 or a profit to equity of about 15 times. So they basically want to value the company at 15 million down in the fifth year. And this is assuming that the return on investment is about 10 times what they put in. So they put in 500,000, they expect to get 5 million out. Um, what I think this really ties back to for everybody is if you put it into the calculator, you get that this is about a $1.15 million in pre-money valuation, about 1.65 million post money. So after that $500,000 is there. And I think this is likely a, a reasonable example of how this works. And what I wanted to come back to on that is that if the investor is willing to invest and get about 15 times or 15 X on the, the PE and about 10 times their investment in about five years, that's a return on investment of about 60%. Um, it, if you back into those numbers and see that they want their investment to grow by about 60% every single year. And that ties back to where we were looking before at the, the different rates that are going to be expected for the, um, for the various investments. So you'll see that as it grows over time and as, you know, there's certainly a fair bit of risk in this one that it's going to grow this much over the next few years. Um, and, and investors going to expect a pretty significant amount to to justify that expense. So then I wanted to take that concept and tie it back to the, the cost of capital and specifically the cost of equity for a company. Um, we talked a little about the, the return on investment and that's really looking at it from the, the side of an investor. What do they want to exchange in exchange for them putting their money up for the the certain amount of time that they're expecting. Um, cost of capital is really kind of the reverse of this. It's the, the value that a company is willing to um, allow somebody to invest in it, knowing you know, the various components that make it up and the various risk associated with it. A lot of this becomes interchangeable. And at, at some point, well down in the future for a mature company, they're gonna be roughly the same. Um, but this is something that gets calculated by a lot of financial folks. It, it becomes more of a science. And I think for a mature company, it's more and more scientific, but there's still quite a few subjective pieces to it. And, and that's probably the area we spend some of the most time as valuators really looking at is trying to understand what the, the cost of capital for a business is because it helps us understand what the risk is and, and what's being given up by the, the particular company that's being invested into. Um, so really, I think the way to, to think about this is, you know, you can calculate the cost of capital for your company, but then you're gonna have basically a, a hurdle rate for an investor that they're gonna wanna get over. Um, you know, they're gonna wanna return on investment likely above this. It, it really wouldn't make sense for a company to, um, allow investments below their cost of capital, even though that happens if you want to, to, to spur a certain amount of investment, but it's at least a starting point to, to understand your business. Um, the way we look at it generally, um, you know, again, this is really getting to a measure of risk of the business. Um, this is really, it's called the build-up method. There, there's a few other ways to do it. And some of these get really scientific and involve um, what's called beta out in the market. But just for simplicity purposes, I think this is the, 
the easiest concept. And, and what this is doing is building up the, the different pieces of risk that an investor would expect to get back. Um, I think this next slide even shows it a little bit better because you're thinking about this from the, the idea that there's certain risks that are inherent to the market and can be diversified away. They're, they're basically unsystematic risk. Um, but as you get to a specific company, you're going to have more and more risk associated with it. So if you think about this, you know, at the highest level, you think of risk-free investment, you may be able to get over the long term, um, the assumption is probably about two to two and a half percent return. Um, but then you step that up again for equity and you say, okay, if I made a generic return or generic investment in the equity markets, it's well diversified, it's across the entire platform, I would probably expect another 6% return or so, so about 8%, which is you know, what you would expect thinking about a, a good investment in the market today. Then you start to think about the, the size premium, um, you know, trying to think about this compared to companies of similar size. So knowing startups are generally pretty small, thinking about this from the, the perspective of what it would be like to invest in a, any small company across multiple industries, that's probably another five or 6%. So you're starting to talk 12 to 15% um, return that would be expected. Then you've got your industry risk, um, you know, getting more and more precise. So your industry risk may be one to 2%, an, an additional return that somebody would expect because technology is likely a little bit more risky than just a well-diversified small company. And then you get to the company-specific risk. And this is where this really becomes more of an art. We can sit here as appraisers and nail down a reasonable rate for each of these down to the company-specific, which is going to be much more of the art. Um, we really have to evaluate the companies. And, and for a mature company, this is likely another two, three, four percent, somewhere in that range. It's it certainly a little bit more risky for most companies, um, especially the ones that, that we look at, but startups start to become much more risky. And this ties back to the, the yields that we were talking about earlier. Um, this can be 25, 30 percent based on the different factors and based on where they are um, on their growth trajectory. So as you think about those company specific risk, you know, this is really an assessment that everybody has to think about when they're trying to understand the, the cost of their equity. Um, you know, I think the key ones that jump out that may be useful to everyone to think about is the, the depth of management. Obviously the better a company is managed, the more secure an investor is gonna feel. Um, you know, I think the an easy example is if Mark Zuckerberg was going to go start a new tech startup, investors would have a lot of faith in him. If I went and did it, being a CPA that looks at valuation all day, no one would want to invest in me. Um, you know, I think the the similar type thing is working on the the competitiveness of the industry and the the barriers to entry. Um, if you think about restaurants versus manufacturing. Um, restaurants are generally pretty easy to get into. You just need a, a space and somebody that knows how to cook. Um, manufacturing, if you want to take, you know, airplane manufacturing, um, you know, that's something that that isn't accessible to most people. You can't go build a plant and learn how to build an airplane um, just kind of on some back of envelope calculations. So there start to be more and more barriers to to enter into that. And then um, specific individuals, I think is another one that is probably relevant to everybody. And this goes back to who's doing some of the developing, especially on the, the early startups. Um, and and this will change throughout the life cycle of a company. Going back to the, the Mark Zuckerberg example, when Facebook was very small and growing, he was, a lot of that company. If you had removed him, it would have substantially changed the business. Um, you know, I think you can argue today that that's much less of a risk for somebody coming in. Um, they've built it up. They've got obviously all sorts of different folks that they can rely on. And, and if he were to decide one day not to do this anymore, um, you know, there wouldn't be as much of an impact to investors. 
So I'll, I'll pause there again, just thinking about how the the different risk work on the, the cost of capital, just to see if there were any other questions that, that might be useful at this point. Okay, well, from there I wanna pivot a little bit from just talking about the theory of how businesses get valued and how that risk gets quantified into to somebody looking at value and, and think about how different decisions that you guys can make and different decisions, both prospectively and, and as you grow can impact the value of the company. Um, Matt, if yeah. I can interrupt, par pardon me. Um, we had a question raised in the chat bar. Um, going back a slide, can you talk a little about um, your experience in evaluating technology risk? Yeah, I think, you know, technology risk is going to be similar to a, a lot of the other risk. And, and I want to make sure I get this in the way that, that you guys are thinking. I know you guys know we spend a lot of time really in the healthcare space, but we do some work in, in non-healthcare areas, including technology. Um, but when I'm thinking of technology risk, the biggest thing that pops up to me is the, the technology life cycle and, you know, how long it's going to take for development versus how long you're going to be able to get benefits as a company. Um, you know, if it's something that takes five years to develop, but it may go obsolete three years after that, there's going to be much more risk than if it's something that you can develop in two years and you can get a 10 year horizon out of. Um, and that's obviously something that an investor is going to be thinking about and something that they're going to be building into the amount of risk that they're willing to take and the, the funding that they're going to put in and the return that they're going to expect. Um, it, and it's really going to be specific to the the facts and circumstances of, of really your particular company and the the technology that you're building. Um, but when I think of the risk, those are probably the the biggest things that that jump out to me immediately. Does does that help answer that question? And I would also throw in well, first of all, there's the does this technology work? Do, have you validated it with customers and are they willing to pay for it? Mm -hmm. And then connecting that to competitiveness, companies are de-risked, technologies are de-risked for a fairly long period of time through intellectual property and, and patent protection. Yeah, and that's where, you know, I think, I'm sure this is an example, at least some folks in here are familiar with um, Shark Tank, the show. Um, that's something that honestly, my wife and I watch way too much because again, I spend my days doing valuation. Um, but patents, they talk about that all the time, how much more value there is in a company that has patented their ideas. It, and it goes back to the idea of the competitive, competitiveness of the industry and barriers to entry. Um, if you've got that patent on your your technology and no one else can do it then like you were saying john there there's a time horizon there that you've locked in the ability to be the person selling that um it, it's there's obviously some play in there that somebody will try to knock it off to an extent and you know try to get something close if it's really a great idea and we see that in in things all the time um but you're absolutely right it's it's the it's really going back again to the the risk the investor is taking and, and what they can lock up and project in the future. Um, so going back, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that we think about this on on some ways to to help you think about some of these decisions as as your companies continue to grow and really give you some more perspective on some of the impacts that you can have on, on what the value of the company is. Um, and I think the things that folks can, can really impact the most is thinking about your, your pricing and your margin. Um, so, so your pricing is pretty self-explanatory. Your margin is really an element of how you control your expenses. So, you know, 
how does my value change if I bump up my pricing or how does it change if I start to be um, better with my expenses and, and, and control them a little bit more. So what I did here was just pull together a quick example. And this just assumes a company that's doing about a, a 1.5 million in revenue. They're, they're continuously growing at 10%. They're expected to grow just for simplicity's sakes forever at 10%. Um, for base purposes, say that their margin's about 20%. Um, and then their effective tax rate's about 25%, which is gonna be pretty close to most profitable businesses. Um, and then we just assume that the cost of capital is about 22%, um, which is, a, you know, what we would expect for a company that's historically producing some sorts of revenue here. Um, an important caveat is this doesn't include any depreciation or capital expenditures in the future. And I think going back to some of the topics we talked to earlier, if you have a lot of capital assets build up, you're going to probably get more impact, especially on the revenue side than you will um, from this example, because your depreciation of your, your capital expenses is really going to um, show up on the bottom line because you're not going to get hit for the expenses as much. So depreciation really will come into play if you have a, a substantial amount of fixed assets. But what you see in here is as you move across and, and just use that base scenario of about 2.24 million that's at the the 20% margin and 0% price increase right down here. Um, if you add another 5% to the revenue and keep everything else the same, and, and this obviously assumes that you have a, a product out there that um, isn't really sensitive to pricing. If you move it up 5%, you're not going to actually lose any sales. And that's certainly an important thing to factor in. But just moving all of that revenue up 5% moves your value up in this scenario about 100,000 and some change. Um, it, it's going to be a little less than 5%, but you're going to see that there's a very close correlation, especially with no depreciation on um, the growth and value from the growth of the revenue. What I think is more interesting is how much of an impact the margin has. And using this example, if you went from 20 down to about 15. So if you saved 5% on your expenses, um, I guess the margin would actually be going down or up, so move down a box. Then you would see that your value grows substantially more. In this case, it's about 550,000 doing some quick math, which is getting close to about a 25% impact. So you'll see that those margin impacts are really very impactful to to the bottom line value in this, you know, oversimplified example. Um, the, the other thing I think is interesting, just tying back to market data. And I know we talked a little bit about how different multiples work and how it's a really good rule of thumb. Um, I think the one thing I'll caution about um, multiples is that they're really a conglomeration of a whole bunch of different data points. Um, one of the things that we think about when we're doing this is that each company is certainly different and we want to pressure test their multiples against the market data. Um, but sometimes using that market data may be just a little too simplistic. But this example puts that that value to, to EBITDA of about seven and a half. So that's assuming that an investor could basically get their money out of a business in about seven and a half years. Um, which I think the time horizon from, from a lot of investors is going to be that five to eight year range. So then the one of the last key areas I wanted to spend some time on was just thinking about hey, how- Hey, Matt, before you yep. shift, take a look okay. at the chat. Take a look at the chat bar. Winnie is asking, do you have any strategies on setting the initial price such that you capture all the value and attract potential customers without lowballing your product. Yeah, that's that's a great example, and that's something. Honestly, we get asked to do relatively frequently. Um, you know, we're thinking about different services that are offered, and the the way I generally think about this, and this is where you have to think too about how you're 
your initial pricing is set versus what your expenses will look like in the future. But you should be able to think about this as to what your normalized costs are going to be. Um, you know, you expect that, you know, on the front end, you're obviously going to have a, a lot of costs dropped into your initial product. Um, but you know roughly what that's going to look like in the future when it's a bit more normal. Um, you know, what are the, the different assets that are needed to support your product? What's the, the overhead that you need to pay your, your management? What do you need to pay the people that are building out some of these products? And you should be able to think about what that cost is. And then I think about it from the standpoint of what's a reasonable profit margin for that. And a lot of times you'll see what other companies in the space are able to do in that, in that situation. Um, you know, industries are very different. Um, you know, I think about some of the, some of the, the more service industries are probably operating, um, sometimes with a higher margin because they're, they're recouping everything from a particular person. Whereas, you know, if you were a, a pencil manufacturer, for example, your margin is going to be substantially lower because you're going to be cranking out a whole lot of product and, and you're not going to put this huge upcharge on it. Um, but I think getting an understanding of the, the cost that you have involved and then making sure that you, you set a reasonable margin that's going to cover all of your expenses and leave a little bit of profit in a normalized environment, that's probably, in my mind, the best way to think about initial pricing. Um, the other thing you'll want to consider is, you know, what does the market support for similar products? Um, and, you know, it's kind of the same way that we think about the, the market valuation. You know, you're never going to find a one-to-one -one match, but you're going to see other things out there and, and know what the cost is on there and may, be able to make certain reasonable adjustments to get closer to, refre to reflect your product. Um, so it really comes down to, again, as a lot of valuation does, a bit of an art and a bit of a science, um, but those are probably the, the key considerations that, that come to my mind immediately. Um, John, I'll let you share any other perspective you have, having seen some of these more. No, I'm, I'm, I'm right with you, Matt. Um, there's an additional comment in the chat bar from Brandon, and he says, based on my experience, if your incremental marginal cost of manufacturing is near zero, such as software, the freemium basic version approach is, works best. The freemium basic version approach works best. For hardware, this is a different story because the incremental marginal cost of production is greater than zero. Um, actually, can I follow up on my question? So um, that's great. On Thank you for the comment on how to set your initial pricing. But let's just um, assume that I set my initial price and I did it wrong, wrong in the sense that I actually lowball it. So I, I should probably like sell for $10 and I mark it for $5. Are there any way to like increase your price without like, um, I guess, scaring away your uh, customers. And so, so that's one thing. And then let's um, also do it the other way. Now you actually set your price too high. Like you said, $15, but you should probably sell it for $10. Um, is there any way you should uh, like decrease your price or we um, brand your price such that now you don't seem like, okay, now your your so your product is actually pretty cheap and like you high ball your price. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, and and I think that's a great point, Winnie. And and just thinking, you know, I think you're going to have your initial pricing, and then you're going to have how your pricing is going to fluctuate. And you know, from a, a consumer confidence standpoint, you probably don't want to move those drastically, but you're certainly going to have the the ability to move them. I think if you double or triple your price or conversely drop it significantly, um, I guess, depending on the situation, your, your buyers are either going to think they bought it at a great time or wonder why it dropped so much so quickly. 
Um, but really, it's going to get to an equilibrium that the market will support. Um, it goes back to that old economics supply and demand. Um, if you price it too cheap, what you what you're going to see is that you know you're going to have this huge influx of of customers coming to it, it and you may not be able to support the demand. Um, conversely, if you price it too high, the market's going to sit there and say, um, you know, that's too high and there's not going to be a substantial demand for it. I think the, the other challenge and the assumption there is that there's also going to be a bit of marketing that comes into play as well, just because it's not selling, you obviously have to have awareness out there as well. So the, that equilibrium example assumes that everybody knows about the product and is able to get it. Um, but over time, those should balance out between the, um, the, the ability to support the, the base cost and the incremental cost and then what the, the market's going to bear. Does that help some, Winnie? Yeah, yeah, that, that makes more sense. I mean, i never done this before, so... Um... <laughs> Yeah. Depends on like I. It's okay if you kind of make the the first number wrong, and you still have some chance to kind of readjust it over time. That that's great. Yeah, and I think about you know this is going a little bit outside of the the necessarily the technology development realm, but I think now how many of these sites that are popping up that that do like early entry into products where somebody can can jump in early and and you know typically they probably get it at a discounted price um but they're very early on in the the product life cycle um you know i think things like that where you have kind of a test market is is great to see what the market will support um before calling what your fixed price is um but certainly, I think we see that that prices evolve for companies all the time as they get out there and they see the demand. Um, you know, I think about you know brand new technology that comes out in televisions. You know, I I haven't bought one in a while, so I'm probably way off on my ba basis here. But when they changed over to the technology that allows flat screens up to 60 inches, um, you know, those TVs were three or four thousand, but as they started to get more on the market and more customers had it and there was more demand for it, you know, they achieved some efficiencies and that price has dropped drastically where you can get one now for four or $500. Um, you know, that, that pricing definitely varies over time and, it, and it's just responsive to, to what's going on in the market, both from the consumer standpoint, as well as similar competitors that are gonna influence them. Brandon, you've got some more discussion points. Do you want to, can you click in and and maybe talk through some of those? Yeah, sure. Um, when when we introduced a product, uh, it's, it's the hardest thing is setting the, the price point because uh, when you're initially introducing it, you really want to get feedback to improve it. But it's complex because if the product is expensive, you have to cover your costs on that. Um, and the costs are somewhat unknown for some of your initial manufacturing runs. Once you go through them, then you know that. So um, activating a small manufacturing run, uh, it's one of the hardest things to determine the price. So that's a good question. Uh, I would err on the side of having buffer um, because if you, um, if you run out of money in a manufacturing run, it's not good. So you always want to have more than less, uh, but you don't want to have two more. Uh, and that's something, you know, internally you have to figure out what you're comfortable with, what level of risk and exposure on that. And then the second one is on a product demand. Uh, we have a product that's out there now and the influx is greater than the manufacturing capacity that we have with working capital. So we had to adapt our product delivery to go from a completed product to a kit that the end user could assemble on site uh, to be able to better match demand for 2021. Great. Thanks, Thank Brandon. You. Yeah, I, I think that's really good, um, you know, real life examples of, 
kind of how the, the pricing piece works. And, it, you know, this is where I think it's really exciting what you guys are doing both, you know, in the, the development cycle, as well as just, you know, the, the enhancements to the, the community here. Um, but, you know, where I sit, this becomes more and more theory versus real life application. And that's where I think it's really interesting to hear these stories because, you know, from my perspective, you know, there is that, that curve and you can make it more scientific, but I think Brandon, your example shows some of the, the real life pieces, you know, how do you manufacture those, those initial runs at the right price? Um, and, it, and it's easy to look out to what a, a normalized run is going to look like when you're, you know, getting closer to maturity and able to make large runs, but how do you price that appropriately for the beginning? Um, you know, are you willing to take more of a loss to get that feedback um, or, or at least not as great of revenue or as great as of profits to, to get that? And I think as business owners, th those are decisions that, that, you'll be making on a daily basis. And, you know, it, it's really getting back to the, to an overall pros and cons and cost benefit analysis. I think Brandon, your example, especially using the, the initial run, maybe you are willing to take either a, a lower profit margin or even a little bit of a loss early on to get that feedback because you know that that's gonna help you in the long run. Um, but but certainly there's financial considerations with that in in taking that versus your uh, the profit you would expect in the future. Agreed. And I would I would really, from our experience, I would put that initial manufacturing run as a prototype. Yeah. And I wouldn't um, I wouldn't recommend charging for that quote unquote. You need to charge something maybe for labor, uh, but for that actual product, consider it more an evaluation for your market to give you feedback. And then you'll know you can make the prototype and what your true costs are. And then for the next round, you can set your price. The only caveat to that is it takes capital to do that. So that there in line lies the conundrum. Definitely. Great. That was really good conversation. Were there any other questions or, or input at this point before we move on? I've just got to a couple more slides related to, to valuation before we go to cap table, but I, I really like the discussion we're having here. Sounds good. Um, well, the last thing I just wanted to touch on, and, and this is more of a, of a real world valuation example of just how investors will, will look at this. I, I know we had turn our, previous discussions about cash flow projections and how that works, but I really wanted to talk about how the reliability and, and really the reasonableness comes back to, to valuation and how valuators consider that. Um, just to give everybody a little bit of appreciation as to how appraisers are going to look at a company. Um, so I'm going to show you two scenarios real quick that are basically projections for the same company. Um, these are really just for illustrative purposes that they're really based off a more mature company, but it helps hammer home the concept of how different levels of growth are, are considered by, by evaluator. Um, so the first scenario is just a, a company that has relatively slow growth in their revenues over time, about a 3% increase every year. Their margin was 30% historically, and they're staying about the same. Um, and the first thing you'll jump to is that, you know, the value is about 300 and about 20,000. Um, the, the second scenario I'm going to show you is a much more opportunistic. And again, this is really focused on a mature company, but just to illustrate, you'll see that there's 7% growth, 5% growth, 3% growth, um, coming back to normal, but, it, but this is something we see clients with quite frequently that they, they, tell us that there's going to be a lot of growth the first year. And then you'll see that the EBITDA margin starts to grow as well. Um, it was 30% historically. They show it going up to 50%. Um, this is probably a bit exaggerated, but I think it, it at least helps note that this, um, the exercise that we're doing here. And you'll see that the indicated value is actually exactly the same. And where this ties in is just looking at how 
the evaluator looked at both of these. Um, you know, your, your risk-free, your equity premium, all of those are going to be about the same, but that company specific is really where evaluator has a lot of play in trying to understand um, what's reasonable and, and, and what the risk are. Um, so really why this is important to you, it just shows that when somebody else is looking at pro formas, they're always going to take them with a, a bit of a grain of salt. And that's where that art of appraisal really comes in. Um, obviously more growth is inherently riskier. Um, showing improvement in margins above historical is going to be um, a higher risk. And that's going to lead to a higher cost of capital and a higher rate of return that's required by the investor. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show this as an example in terms of, you know, when you're putting projections out there, it it, it certainly has to be reasonable. And I, I really appreciate that at this point in your company life cycle, that's going to be harder to do. And you are going to show a lot of growth. Um, but being able to to justify to somebody looking at the valuation and somebody that is coming in and investing money and wants to understand where your valuation came from, they're going to want to understand where that growth is coming from, whether you've assessed the market and see that it can sustain your product. Um, you, you've got the, the management expertise in the company or the developmental expertise that that's going to actually help drive this. Um, so I just wanted to show that as a quick example. And then the last area I just want to touch on real briefly is how um, sometimes there's adjustments made to the, the base value when, when folks are just trying to do this quicker as a more of a, a rule of thumb type item to look at the, the valuation where it's really more of an art than a science. Um, I think, John, you'd, you'd help me pull this together, but this is really talking about the, the pain and, and Berkus model. And what these are, in my mind, is scorecard methodologies. So an investor is looking at this and saying, you know, here's the average amount that companies are getting invested in them, whether in the, the industry sector or, or similar companies, and then they're weighting your company against it. Um, you know, is management better than most on the market? If so, then there's a premium. Um, is the market size huge? Well, then there's you another another premium. There's a lot more out there for to to support a higher valuation. Um, you know, are you early on in there? You may get a reduction. You may not be quite at a hundred percent for that. And then what they'll do is apply it to the the average investment. I think we said about three point seven million here. I know. John showed that that number's gone up a little bit since then. But just for concept, you see that this one, when we run through this example, the weighted average is about 1.9%. So you would just apply that to your, um, your, your estimated starter value, if you will, and do just a, a rule of thumb. Um, you know, I think John can probably give some perspective into the frequency of use. I know from my perspective, as we were saying, we look at it based on projections and income. I, there's certainly a lot of leeway in how folks try to value a company. I think this is obviously a, a valuable way to look at it, especially when you don't have that quantifiable data to take it down the, the science route. Um, but definitely wanted to mention this in case it's, it's useful to everybody here. Um, with that, I'm about to turn it over to Rob for the, the capital tables. Um, I just want to say, I mean, I'll obviously be around and, and taking questions, but just wanted to emphasize again that we really appreciate you guys having us here today. We appreciate the work that you're doing, um, especially in this community. Um, I sit in Knoxville. I love this city. Um, have a great appreciation for UT and, and what they've done with the research park. So just really appreciate your guys' contributions. Um, I'm certainly happy to be a resource for everyone, either today or in the future. I know one of the things that as folks are growing businesses, it's about a lot of times who you know to answer different problems. And I'm certainly happy to, to serve as that resource as you guys are thinking about valuation and may have other questions. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Rob, um, unless there's any other questions that, that you guys want to go through on this right now before we flip. Matt, great job. Thank you. Thanks, Matt, and I will share my screen here now.
All right, what are, are you guys able to see the slides right now? Um, someone just confirm that for me. Gotcha. Cool. All right. So uh, thanks again for having us all today. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction of myself. I'm a senior manager at PYA in our audit department. Um, in that role, I primarily deal with entities that have either private equity or venture capital uh, backed funding. Uh, we come in as auditors typically uh, a little later in the life cycle where uh, that particularly venture capital or private equity firm that has invested would like to start to get audited financial statements. And one of the, the first things that, that we typically will look at when, when we get engaged by a new client is make sure that we can understand their cap table. So in understanding their cap table, we'll, we'll kind of start out here with the, the simplicity of what is a cap table. Well, the cap table is going to be your mathematical description and analysis of the ownership of the company, which is probably a uh, wildly oversimplified version of exactly what your cap table is. Um, but it's, it's who owns the company and how much of it do they own. Uh, that ownership is, uh, is very important. Also, I did, uh, before I get going too far, if I drop off, I will be back very shortly. Um, I sit in our Nashville, Tennessee office. You may know that uh, on December in, uh, on Christmas Day, a bomb went off here, and we have AT and T internet, and uh, they keep uh, re re replugging in things that cause our internet here in the office to go out. But I've got a backup uh, set up quickly, so if I disappear, I'll be back um, as quick as I can. Um, but uh, you know, your cap table is going is increasingly important um, as soon as you take any sort of investment in the ownership of the business goes beyond that of just the initial founders, right? Um, and your cap table is going to help to, to understand what happens in the event of a liquidity event. And that liquidity event is, and how that plays into your cap table is uh, commonly referred to as the waterfall. And a waterfall, uh, if you think of it, is going to be, you think of a tiered waterfall is going to be when you get money at a, at a liquidation event, who gets paid and, and in what order do they get paid? And how does that relate to the various um, types of equity that you have, that you have within the entity? Um, you know, generally, your cap table is going to start out with, with in-kind contributions for that initial common stock that goes directly to your founders of the business. Um, there can also be initial common stock uh, granted to, to others, whether they're advisors, key hires. A lot of times in that initial round too, you might have a friends and family round of you know, $10,000 here or there where somebody ends up with some equity. It's very, very important to track all of this very early on and work with your lawyers and other trusted advisors to make sure that somebody's keeping those stock certificates, somebody's keeping track of this. Um, and I can tell you firsthand, uh, we've dealt with a, a number of clients who maybe didn't keep as, uh, as good a track of it as possible. And uh, when it came time for that, that first audit um, or that, that first time through having to really deal with the cap table, it turns out that uh, the owners, uh, the founders ended up realizing that uh, they'd given away a little bit more of the business than they thought they had over time, which is a, um, that's, that's not a fun pill to swallow. Um, you know, another thing that significantly can complicate your cap, your cap table are options and warrants. Uh, you know, your options are typically going to be used to incentivize uh, key hires to come on board um, and, and help to boost their compensation through future equity. Uh, we'll get into uh, various types of options in a little bit. And then warrants um, are typically, uh, you know, the probably most common warrant that we can discuss here would be uh, in a lot of cases, you may have a um, private equity or venture fund that's willing to initially put in, say, convertible debt um, so that they can, in the event of a waterfall, at, at that, as a debtor, they're above equity, they're going to get paid first, right? But it, once it converts, they're going to have a little bit more of an incentive, and that can be in the form of warrants. Uh, warrants can also just be attached to 
um, initial uh, third party debt as well, particularly on some of your venture backed banks. Um, you know, these are these are all important features of the company that that should jump out. And again, uh, same same as with Matt, if anybody has any questions or wants me to dive a little bit more into anything, which we're going to get deeper into a lot of these as I go on, um, please feel free to uh, to let us know in the chat. Um, I don't know as a presenter if I can necessarily see the chat, but I'm sure I'm sure John or Matt or somebody will uh, will let me know if anybody's asked a question. I'm so, watch. Gotcha. So. Your cap table, again, it's really important. It's gonna evolve greatly as your company matures. We'll see, we'll see cap tables that, that may be very simple. There's five, 10 investors, it's relatively early on. We'll also see a cap table where, you're, where a company's on a series D funding and it is incredibly complex. There's been safes that have been converted. You've got convertible debt that's come through. There's warrants out, there's thousands upon thousands of options that have been granted to, to employees uh, to bring them on. Um, and, and making sure that you're keeping track of all of that and having your trusted advisors keep copies, help you to manage it and understand it is incredibly important. It's also an amazing planning tool, right? Because your cap table can ultimately help you plan uh, how things are going to look if you decide to raise to raise more money because uh, you could you could be five years in and, and be at a point where you're potentially ready to entertain offers or you're potentially to, for that liquidity event or you know it's time to maybe raise series C series D what does it look like are you willing to to get get watered down a little bit more and we'll talk about uh, how it can look from a from a valuation standpoint from everything else uh, and, and how to use your cap table as that planning tool a little bit later on we've got a, a, a really cool tool um, that uh, that we'll share with you that can kind of show how that valuation can change over time as as investors come in um, so, with that, let's talk about some important cap table terms. So, uh, and these are all going to be terms that are, are going to be directly spelled out in your articles of incorporation. So as, as your business continues to evolve, it's always important to work, work with your lawyers, work with your accountants, work with your trusted advisors to, to update that articles of incorporation, which is ultimately going to be your driver as to what's there. So typically your first thing that's going to be there is, is going to be your, your common stock or your, common, your most common form of equity. This is going to be your, your, entity, your, your owners that have, they have rights to profits, they have at liquidation, and they're typically your voting shares. Um, now, there can be a non-voting form as well, uh, and, and it, it's important to remember that with a lot of these terms, they can be written how you and your other investors want them to be written. There, there's not necessarily one exact form that you have to follow, and that, that's where it can be very important to work with a, a good attorney, with a, a good accountant, and, and understand your cap table and understand what exactly you're giving away. But common stock is going to uh, primarily at the beginning be your initial investors. You can set your, your common stock, uh, what we would call par price at effectively whatever you want. Um, I mean, we see many that are set at one ten thousandth of a, of a, of a penny, um, right? And that, that, that is where uh, typically, your 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 par value, anything that's over that par value, gets gets recorded, of course, in equity at, at what we would call additional paid in capital. But uh, that par value is going can be effectively whatever you want it to be. It doesn't necessarily have to be tied directly to the valuation of the company. Um, so typically, your par value in your common stock has a has a very very low value on on your balance sheet, but that's also to help your your founders be able to come in and uh, and and receive that equity for the um, for the sweat equity that they put into the business. Uh, preferred stock is typically going to be next. You know, we we see a lot of times. 
uh, preferred stock, you know, preferred series A uh, be being a, say a, a first preferred series or A1, you know, whatever, however it ends up getting named is typically going to be um, the, the next thing that comes in. Now, preferred stock means that they generally have special rights or preferences over common. Um, preferred stock would be an investor who's put in where, for, um, for just simplicity's sake, we'll say a million dollars. And they are going to, in when we talked about a waterfall earlier, they're going to be above common. Now, they're also typically going to have a, a cap in some ways on their return because typically preferred stock would be, we're gonna put it in a million, but it's gonna accrue an 8% dividend annually. Uh, now you don't have to pay that 8% out of pocket each year if you don't want to most of the time. It's, it can just accrue, they're generally, um, they don't technically accrue on your balance sheet or anything until it's time to declare them, until the board declares that you're going to pay them. So uh, there's no reason to be necessarily scared off at the beginning from that 8%, you know, you got a million dollars, it's not like you're having to pay that $80,000 out annually. Uh, that 80,000 is just going to be something that's due to those preferred shareholders at the time of a liquidation event. A lot of preferred stock has the ability though to convert upon liquidation to common in the event that common is going to get it uh, more money than the uh, preferred would. So for in our million dollar example, if we're three years down the road and a waterfall event shows that uh, that preferred would get more than 1.24 million, they may convert to equity. But that's however you'd like to set it up in your articles of incorporation and define those specific rights for a preferred stock. Uh, participating preferred, uh, as, as we say here, is paid at some multiple of the original price and can participate in common distributions. That's, that's very similar to what we just discussed. Um, but you know, the one, one thing that I wanna spend a lot of time or maybe a little more time here on are your options and your option pool. They are, I think, very, very important to, to any early stage entity because they're such a tool for attracting and retaining talent. And Options can be a, a great thing, but they can also turn into a, a, a pain in the side, right? Because, uh, and, it all and it can all depend on how you'd like to structure them. Um, you know, we, we see a number of different options when they're given out to employees. And I think one thing that's very, that, uh, you know, I just want to stress here is that there is, there is a way to give options at, to your employees as, as additional compensation without it creating a taxable event to your employees. I'd say we see uh, greater than 90% of the time where those options are awarded to an employee and there is no taxable event. Uh, you can work with your, with your tax accountants and with your attorneys on this, of course, but uh, the, what is ultimately done is a form is filed with the IRS that says, hey, we gave, we gave John uh, 100,000 uh, option shares. However, we gave them to him at no value, right? We gave them to him. Uh, they have a value of a dollar. We believe that the underlying equity is worth one dollar. He effectively got nothing and he's not going to get anything until a until something occurs that results in a cash transaction that would give him equity. And that's called an 83B election with the IRS and it results in no taxable event to the employee. Um, and that can be an important thing because it can, you know, if you create that taxable event by giving them equity that is beyond the valuation of the underlying shares, uh, and you've created that taxable event, now you may have further complicated things by having to now um, potentially do tax distributions to the employee to help them pay for those taxes. Uh, they may become a, an employee who has to receive a K-1 annually, things like that. Typically, you want to make sure that your options are 
or well, one set up to where you're not creating that taxable event, not because when, once you create that taxable event, there's going to be a lot of other things that happen down the road that can complicate your, your tax return. They can complicate a lot of other things that result in additional cost to the business that especially at an early stage, uh, you may not want to incur. The other thing that I think, uh, and you know, in, in, in talking with John yesterday, as we as we were walking through a lot of this, that and, and Matt as well, that that's that's very important to consider when you're thinking of your options, is how do they vest? How are they they tied to the employee? Uh, you know, one of the most common and best things that we see is that you cannot exercise that, that an employee cannot exercise options unless they are an employee of the business. Because if they're able to exercise an option per se, without being an employee of the business, now what you have is you have an owner, you potentially someone who has exercised common stock and has now potentially earned themselves a spot on your board who used to be an employee, right? And they're probably not an employee anymore for a reason. And I'll share a real world example of this. I have a, a, a very good friend from college who worked for a uh, well-known um, company out of Austin, Texas for a number of years. And he received a number of options and ultimately was the first employee they'd ever had who left the firm or the company who elected to exercise those options. He now has voting rights and the ability to participate in board meetings very much against the founder's will. Um, and can more or less be a pain in the founder's side. The other thing that happened when he exercised those options is when you exercise those options, typically they're exercised at the fair value of the business. So tying back into what Matt said, Matt, Matt was discussing earlier, they had to take this business and value it. And they presented him what they thought the business was worth. And he said, no, my option agreement states that if we can't agree on the biz on the value, that the company now has to pay for a valuation of the company. So they had to go out and spend um, well above a five-figure amount to get this business that was that's worth um, over a hundred million dollars at this point. Get a formal valuation done on it to value the equity of my friend. Ultimately, uh, not saying that he did it entirely to be a pain in the butt, but there was a part of it that was done that way. And it was because of the way that these things were structured very, very early on. The company's now worth over $100 million. He joined when it might have been worth five, right? And they would not have structured the equity to where Andrew could have ended up on the board um, and with equity if that at, as a non-employee uh, with, with certain foresight. Um, another potential option that is always available with, uh, with your options or unit pool is that they only vest if you're still an employee and upon a liquidation event. If you do that, those two things, there's, there's things in your accounting guidance where you never actually have to value these things until a liquidation event, at which point the value is known because we know how much money we're getting. And you know, don't have to put them on the books of your company um, as, an, as, an, as a compensation expense. It, anything, anything where vesting can occur in any way that's not directly tied to a liquidation of the business, you are His internet, his internet just went out, I think. We're actually going to have to run these things through evaluation model on an annual to your business. I hear you. Hey, Rob, I think we can hear you now. Maybe there you are. Okay. We lost cool. you there for a minute. Rob, at that point, at you know, convenient question point for you. Um, I understand your, your, um, your point that the issuance of options to a prospective employee as as that as that prospect actually enters the employment of the company that doesn't trigger any tax liability no. correct? correct so 
taking it the next step. The, the, the employees are great employees, been there through the entire option period. Mm -hmm. He exercises his options and now he's the proud owner of common stock in the company. Yes. Does that trigger uh, a tax? Is that a tax taxable event? Oh, we lost him. It can be, uh, and it, it, I am. We, we lost you right at the beginning of your answer. We lost you. Okay. Am I back? There you are. All right. I am on my backup internet now. Um, so we must be plugging things back in, 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 uh, downtown Nashville today. Um, you got, so does when, when the employee exercises, her options, mm -hmm. does that create a tax liability? Uh, it can, and um, it, it's going to, and uh, I'm also going to preface this answer, John, with uh, while I am a CPA and I am an auditor, I am not a, a tax guy. Right. Um, so it, it, at the time of exercising the options, it can create a taxable event. Now, that's going to depend on what the value of what they received is, right? And um, exactly uh, how your option pool is, is set up. Um, now, if, if they're able to exercise them prior to a liquidity event, and it's going to be in all likelihood that they have received something of value there that, that is likely going to trigger a, a taxable event at that point. Um, I'm not going to say that it, it couldn't not be a taxable event, but in most cases it is going to be, particularly um, if they've been able to exercise that. Uh, you know, in most cases at that point, they're writing you a check, right, to uh, at, at that value, and there's going to be a valuation of the company that's going to say, okay, um, our, our stock or our, our option holder here, she wrote us a check for $20,000 for 20,000 shares that have an actual value of $60,000. Uh, in all likelihood, that, that, that gap between 60 and 20 is going to be compensation for them that, they, that is going to result in a taxable event. Um, now, that, that, in, that in some cases, uh, you know, if uh, at that point you can decide, uh, do you want to help uh, compensate the employee, maybe a little additional extra via bonus or something in cash to help them with their tax liability, right? Or um, was that purely their decision? And hopefully over this last several years, they've, uh, they've saved up enough money when they made that decision. Um, that, is, that is up to them. Um, it also, you know, it's, it can be important too, if you have an employee who's looking to do something like that, to help them uh, have a conversation with your attorney and your tax accountants who have, who have helped set everything up so that they understand the consequences of what they're doing when they do that, because it could be a very significant taxable event to them where they have created a tax liability while receiving no actual cash, right? Right. So um, let's see. Uh, and before before I move on to warrants, does does anyone else have uh, have any questions at this time on on options and uh, different types of options? You know, one one thing. Uh, if anybody's uh, writing any questions right now, that I will mention. Uh, you know, probably the most common type of option that we see now is uh, would be referred to as a profits interest. A profits interest allows you to give options uh, over a period of time and you're granting them at the money. So if Matt joined the business uh, a year ago and the implied value of the options was, in business at that time was that the options were worth $500 a share, his are going to be granted at the money at $500. Then I joined six months later but the implied value is 750. 
I would get my options at $750 a share such that then it's called a profits interest because I have interest in the profits of the business going forward from that day, right? So you have to assign a value each and every time you award those options. Uh, that value typically you would work with your attorneys and someone like Matt to, to imply what those what the underlying value of those awards is, you're able to get them, give them to them at the money, uh, which also again helps because they're given to them at the money, uh, helps avoid a taxable event. Profits interest are uh, far and away the uh, number one most common way that we see options awarded, uh, I would say at this point. Um, but moving on uh, past options, uh, warrants. These are an important thing uh, to keep track of on your cap table. Uh, they are typically either connected to a new type of equity or convertible debt, or even um, attached to um, traditional third-party debt that may be coming in from a venture capital type backed bank that's maybe loaning not, not per se again, um, against um, capital or capitalized assets, uh, kind of similar to what Matt was talking about earlier, but they're, they're giving you money uh, based on, and they don't have as much collateral. They may as a uh, incentive to hopefully lower their interest rate, uh, attach some warrants that they can exercise at a later date those warrants typically are going to convert to common stock. Um, and they'll, they'll, they'll be spelled out for exactly how they convert and what can trigger conversion to common stock at a later day. Uh, warrants are extremely important to track on your cap table because they're currently, at the time that, do, that you issue them, they're not typically going to be in your equity, right? You didn't receive, you received cash for debt, for example, but you didn't, you didn't receive any cash for these warrants, but you need to track them because in the event of a liquidation event, uh, when you're going through that waterfall, you're going to have to pay, pay out these warrants as well. So they're a very important thing to track because as, as we get down into this next item, the, your share count terms, authorized, issued, not standing, fully diluted, they're going to be a part of your dilution formula. Um, share count terms, authorized, these are the number of shares that you've authorized in your articles of incorporation or similar document. They can be as many shares as you want. You can authorize a billion shares, you can authorize a million shares. You can go in and edit it to authorize more shares later. Um, issued and outstanding. So issued would be if we've issued 500,000 shares of preferred stock, right? Um, right, that, that's true. Outstanding is going to be uh, how many we, we still have left to issue. So these are, these are items that uh, in, when you get to a point where you have to have audited financial statements, for example, you have to disclose to the users of the financials how much, how many are authorized, how many are issued and outstanding. Fully diluted, uh, dilution is going to be, we've issued these many shares, this, this much common, this much preferred, this is what's exactly out there right now. But in most cases, our, our option pool, for example, has not been, um, they, they have not been redeemed, they're still outstanding. But, uh, you know, we haven't received that cash form. And in the event of a liquidation event, they're going to kick in. And that's going to further dilute your common and preferred shareholders ownership of the business. All right, I think. Uh, all right, cap table example one here. Uh, so we're going to go over some examples on cap tables here. Um, again, anybody feel free to chime in. And if a question comes up. Uh, this is a uh, relatively uh, simple cap table here. You'll see that our founders have initial shares. Um, they didn't put anything in. That's their sweat equity, right? And what they currently own. We had an outside advisor who we probably gave some shares to uh, as, as um, compensation for, for their help. 
they've got a share, and then we brought an investor in. And that investor has put in money. And when we put him, his money in, our, our founders effectively went from pre-money, this would, these numbers would have been 50 and 50 for, for simplicity's sake. We can act like the advisor's not there for simplicity's sake, or they could have been 45, 45, and 10. Uh, when we took on money, our, our ownership percentage got diluted down to 27, 27, and four, and now we have our investor. Now, we'll, we'll look at a, a little bit more of a detailed um, he, uh, uh, cap table here for uh, um, a, a real company uh, that I've cleaned up their cap table for, uh, where you can see that, you know, inve the investor here, they, they now have the largest ownership percentage. However, if this is preferred, you have to remember that unless that preference came with a board seat, you're still calling the shots because they, these could be non-voting. And that all depends on how, you know, likely if they're giving you that money and they're the first investor, they're going to want a, a seat at the board and a say, but they could have an equal say to you when it comes to being at the board, even though they have a larger ownership percentage. Um, and then when we think of our, of our waterfall, if this is preferred stock, right, on investor A here, if this is preferred stock right here, uh, they've got their 500,000 that they've put in they are, in or, as an incentive to come in with preferred stock, they're like in, in a waterfall scenario. If you go, if you have to sell or something bad happens or go belly up uh, ahead of time and there is some money to be paid out, they will get paid, the preferred shareholders will get paid before the common do. Um, now they might, they don't have generally as big of a, common's always gonna have your biggest upside right? Uh, common has unlimited upside. Preferred can have, you can have a limit on the upside for preferred because preferred can just get its money back and uh, their, their dividends and arrears that, that are stated in, the, uh, in your agreement. Preferred can also convert to common to where it has that unlimited upside as well. So there, there's, that's your advantage to staying as a common shareholder. Okay, cap table uh, example two. So uh, here we have our, our various rounds and we can see that they are increasing in size, right? We're getting a little bit more money each round. This is relatively common. You know, your business is growing, but you might not have positive cash flows yet. So, but as you grow, you're going to have to ask for some more money um, each time as you continue to invest that into whether it be a sales team, you know, whatever, wherever that money needs to go to be invested. And uh, our pre-money valuation is, is increasing. Now, our investor and our founder, our founder's uh, pro rata ownership here uh, based on our, our round size uh, is going to be impacted by, by the valuation. Um, these are, are all, this, this, this example here is set based on, uh, these are not consecutive rounds. These are, these are kind of different rounds, right? Um, based upon when you decided to take money and what the, the valuation of the business is. And it can, uh, I think that the goal here is to show that uh, if you, you the, the kind of longer that you wait, you can eventually receive a, a larger money uh, valuation with diluting yourself a little bit less. We can see that the delusion of the, the founders here, um, even though they've received more because the valuation was higher, their dilution from 100% down to 75 versus 100% down to 80. Um, so you know your your dilution of your founder equity is uh, an incredibly important thing to watch. And what one thing we're going to show a tool here in a second. Um, again, uh, here's here's where we've taken on even more equity and watered ourselves down even more. Um, but what I want to get to is this Loon Creek example, and I'm going to switch over to it. So Loon Creek, uh, can everybody see? Uh, this screen here, and is it large enough that you can make it out as well? Good. I think I think we're good, Rob. All right. So uh, Loon Creek. Uh, this is a uh, hypothetical uh, pro forma capitalization table. Uh, 
that is a great tool uh, that you can use as a planning model to see your own uh, equity as a founder uh, and how that ultimately impacts you upon exit. So uh, the way that this model works here is that these colored cells are your inputs and we don't really touch anything other than our than the uh, than the colored cells, but we can see that it, you know typically your stock options are going to be common. So if we have a stock option pool that we give all out of five hundred thousand dollars, let's pay attention to our exit value here. This is assuming a twenty million dollar exit. If we give out you know five hundred thousand shares, now we as founders have four hundred thousand. We give out five hundred thousand shares. We can see how much of a dilution that was on our, on our value there. Um, but those, those shares can be very important to give out because it's, it's important to remember that in giving, in giving those shares out, hopefully we've gone from a value of 10 million to a value of 20 million because we have increased the value of our company by bringing on uh, talent. And that talent is going to help us to grow our business. So there, there is always a good reason to give out those options. It, it can lead to a higher exit value. Um, and, and that is the hope. That's why we're doing it, right? Um, but, you know, another, another important thing, and I think cool thing to show here, is our pre-money valuation. So right now, uh, we're initially set up on this model with a pre-money valuation of three quarters of a million dollars, and we're taking on a quarter million. But what if we had, and we can see that right now our founders are going to get five million bucks. So what if we had waited, or we had a pre-money valuation of a million? But if we have a pre-money valuation of a million, uh, that's going to increase our, our exit at the same exit value to from 5 million to 5.3 million. Um, and so you can, you can start to see that as, as you take on that initial raise, the percent that you give at the beginning can have a direct impact at the end on, on your exit. Now, I do wanna preface that this model here, this Loon Creek model is built on the assumption that all of your, uh, that at, at, in this waterfall, that everyone's shares are more or less equal, that there's not a, that there's not a preference on, on your other shares. Uh, I think I see a question that came in, John, is that correct? Um, I don't know why. I think it was just it's Brandon mentioning he had to jump off here in a minute. Perfect. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Get that, Matt. Yeah. yeah. And Sorry, guys, I, when, when a question comes in, it flashes for me, but I, for some reason, can't read it. Um, but we can, we can see the, uh, the same thing here for round two. If we had a $4 million valuation, you can ultimately, instead of a $3 million, we can ultimately see how that impacts here. But uh, one thing I was mentioning there uh, before, we saw the, before I saw the question come in is that this is under the assumption that everything has converted to the same type of stock, to a, to a common stock, which would be a, a relatively common waterfall event in the event that the common is going to be worth more than preferred plus the preferred dividends would be. Um, but your waterfall and how the money is going to flow through your various equity raises is going to be spelled out in your articles of incorporation. And it's incredibly important to monitor. This is a great tool to run through various variables. You know, if we had only given out 200,000 stock options, what happens there? I mean, that, that created a, a, a large increase, but you know, could have that extra 300,000, uh, I think, could have that extra 300,000, could have that given us a $25 million valuation, right? So think about, think about these things as, as you're working through your equity. And then uh, one last thing I wanted to show, this is a, uh, a cap table uh, 
for a, and this, this is to kind of emphasize how, how complex your cap table can ultimately get. This is a real cap table for a client of mine uh, that we've gone through and uh, taken out all of their identification, all of their identifying factors in, but this is an entity that was founded in 2012. Um, it has taken on a, an angel round as well as now a traditional private equity buy-in. Um, here is your uh, private equity buyer. They have a 56% or 57% ownership just about in the business. And we can see that over time, we started out with our initial ownership. We had two founders, uh, one more involved in the business than the other. So they were not equal founders. Um, and over time, they've gone from 75 and 25% ownership down to a fully diluted 17 and 5%. Another thing to show here is that um, our dilution, and uh, if, if you add this table, um, I, had to, I had to kill all of the, uh, um, in order to hide investor names and other things, I had to kill all of the uh, formulas, but your difference between your total outstanding stock and your dilution is simply the exercise of your options and warrants, which are tracked on here. So these options that have been granted to um, other employees and the CEO of this business received options himself, which is common, um, and he, CEO and founder, have they have though taken his ownership down from 19.2 to 17.5. We can also see that same dilution here on our primary uh, our primary investor who is given money as well. You'll, all, you'll notice that our options here are granted to various employees um, for a, and you can see that there are uh, 46 lines of different, of different equity holders on this business. Um, and that we even have uh, our two debt holders here who have loaned money to the business, but given, but it, as part of that loan, they've received 56,000 roughly uh, common shares that will be, that would be exercised in the event of a liquidity event, or in the event that their, their debt is fully repaid, no matter what, they're going to get that equity. Uh, in the case of this business, uh, every time that a round is done, Right, we went from common to we're now on our one, two, three, four, fifth capital raise. Every new raise is going to be senior to generally to the previous raises, right? So your new money is going, the newest money gets paid first in a, uh, in a waterfall event. That is typically how it's going to work. That's the attraction for new money. Uh, John, do we have some questions coming in? Oh, I can see, I figured out the chat. Um, all right, I just see Will saying he's got to run. So, all right. Um, all right, right at the end, I figured out the chat right on time. Um, so, but this, you know, I just wanted to share this as an example of uh, how complex a, a cap table can get. Uh, one thing that you can do uh, with a cap table like this in your planning exercises is, is to start to run through and say, okay, if we had a uh, $50 million liquidity event, how does that work? You know, at what point are my preferred, at what point are my preferred shareholders fully uh, redeemed to the point where my common shareholders now start to get any money? Um, at what point do my is are they fully redeemed and common starts to get money to the point that it's worthwhile for preferred to convert to common in the event of a liquidity event? And those are the rights of your preferred shareholders generally spelled out in your uh, agreement. Uh, with that, I will uh, just say if, if anybody has any questions, I know we're about four minutes over. Um, we can go over that. Uh, one other thing to always keep track of on your capitalization table, if you uh, took on a safe, um, maybe not the, the safest form of investment, but if you've taken on a safe, you're going and it, it's sitting as debt likely on your balance sheet, you're going to want to track on your cap table because a liquidity event typically is going to convert them. Uh, you're going to want to track those as if they were converted and equity on, on your cap table. Um, 
John, uh, any anything else in that regard? How about questions? Anybody have any questions, comments, experience that you want to share? We will, um, Tabitha will send you a slide deck from today's workshop, along with the example cap table from Rob and the Loon Creek cap table. Just a comment on Loon Creek. That is a company in Wyoming. Um, it's headed by um, Kevin Learned. Uh, I think he's got some YouTube channels now, but he's very active in the Angel Capital Association. I really appreciate the way he uh, presents complicated information, including that cap, that cap table um, model. And I can tell you that I have used that cap table model in a real investment. It got worked over. It had that cap table has been ground truth. So unlike some of the other things that we work with S4, for example, which really hasn't been proven cell by cell that uh, the Loon Creek cap table model works very well. So um, any questions, other comments? Matt, Rob, this is Tom. I just want to thank you both for your, your time and energy and intellect. This has really, really been a great, great session. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And I would say, Rogers, for you to say that, having spent a lot of time in this space, that says a lot to Rob and, and Matt, and they should take that as a great compliment. Yeah, the, the, the limited times we've, we've worked through exits um, at, at Tech 2020 and, and other places, a lot of this is really, is really, really just, just really resounded with me. Uh, it's been really good. Thanks. Yep. Matt, Rob, I echo, I echo that. Thank you very much. You guys have, have done a great job and I really appreciated the opportunity to work with you. Tom Ballard, thank you for continuing to be a strong strategic partner. We appreciate it. Thank you, John. Absolutely. Give Marty our best. I will do it. Thanks again for having me. We really enjoyed, I know both on behalf of Rob and myself, working with you guys. Um, and again, if there's anything we can do either now or down the road, feel free to reach out to us as I know it, it's helpful to have contacts in, in other areas. Absolutely. You bet. Thanks guys. Okay, with that, thanks everybody. We're adjourned. <laughs>